The session today is on new water sources. Uh, I'm the chairman. Since I've already been introduced, I will only say that I, again, I'm Bruce Ritman, director of the Sweetie Center for Environmental Biotechnology at Arizona State University. Today's se session is on new water sources. You know, a few years ago, uh, we would never dream of using, you know, polluted wastewaters and highly saline waters for uh, drinking water and other beneficial uses, but because of need and technological advances, suddenly this has become really possible and, and interesting. And so that's what we're going to talk about today with three uh, real leading speakers. And let's get right to it. So our first speaker is uh, Shivaji Deshmukh, who's the Assistant General Manager of the West Basin Municipal Water District in Carson. And he was uh, the Assistant General Manager since, uh, since 2010, overseeing recycling operations and engineering. Before that, he worked for the Orange County Water District. And he's, um, he's uh, active in the water reuse and the AWWA. And I'm pleased to say that the West Basin is an NWRI made uh, member agency. And with that, please. Thank you, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today about West Basin. Uh, it's also a big honor. Um, since the agenda was posted, as you can imagine, a common question I've been, I've been asked is, isn't it very intimidating serving on a panel with Professor Chabanagloss and Professor Elamelik? Um, the answer is yes. However, um, I'm actually very excited because for the first time in my career, I've had a name, I have a name that's shorter and easier to pronounce than my <laughs> panel members. So there's that. Um, one other thing left out of my introduction is I am very fortunate that I got to do my graduate work, my master's thesis, uh, under Professor Elamelik. Um, because of that, I do anticipate being graded after my presentation. And if history repeats itself, I'm going to be lucky to get a B. So uh, today's talk is it's a very direct title. Um, the reason is I've got a very simple uh, directive when I started at West Basin two and a half years ago from uh, my board and my general manager, and that's to increase recycled water production, keep unit costs down. Um, that's, so that's the point of what I'll be uh, discussing today. Uh, we have a very interesting water supply portfolio approach at West Basin, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, uh, but really concentrate on what we're doing now to address the challenges that we have to face with the recycled water program. We are a very unique agency. We are a special district. We are governed by five elected officials. This is very important because to be innovative in water supply, especially in Southern California, it's very important to have a board that supports a very innovative vision. We have five elected directors here, uh, Director Gray, Kwan, Little, Deer, and Smith. Uh, a few of them are in the audience today. All of the projects that we've done at West Basin are because of their progressive thinking. You'll even see it in the fact that our recycled water plant is named after one of our sitting board members. So it's something that we're very appreciative and it really helps us move forward. <clears throat> Aside from having a unique supply portfolio, we also have a very unique service area. We are a metropolitan member agency. So we were created in the 1940s to represent 17 cities at Metropolitan Water District. And as you heard earlier, they're the large imported water provider to Southern California. Uh, our service area is also one of the most unique. You can see it uh, by the colored areas. It goes down the Los Angeles coast from Malibu, uh, jumps over the city of Los Angeles, Santa Monica, Torrance, and Long Beach, and we basically represent everything else. What that creates for us is a very diverse uh, set of customers. We have the beach communities. We actually have oil refineries in our service area. We have a lot of industrial activities because of our proximity to the two ports, Long Beach and Los Angeles. We even have movie studios in Culver City and Manhattan Beach. And ultimately, we have residential customers. So what's that, what that has done to our analysis of uh, recycled water is actually tailored the qualities to meet the needs of our specific customers. And I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail. So before we created uh, or we were formed as a metropolitan agency, our service area basically relied on local groundwater as its source of water. So in 1947, this was our source of water. With the development that quickly changed, being a coastal groundwater or being reliant on coastal groundwater supplies, you can imagine the first problem that we're going to have is seawater intrusion. 
And as the well started getting very salty, we had to shift our demand onto that of Metropolitan Water District. So you fast forward uh, a few decades, and in 1990, we were over three-fourths reliant on imported water, one-fourth on the local groundwater. Our board that I mentioned before, some of them who are still on the board today, uh, recognized that a lot of this imported water supply, while reliable at the time, is not in our control. And we wanted to take a different approach to a water supply portfolio and, and having a very diverse one. Uh, I think that was mentioned earlier in the talk today um, from Devin. We wanted the same approach. And so with a very aggressive recycled water and conservation program, this is where we're at today. We've reduced down to about two-thirds supply on imported water. We have a uh, component of recycled water. We've pushed very hard on conservation, uh, something that we're very proud of, but also has created some challenges that I'm going to talk about when it comes to recycled water. We already discussed, or Marty already discussed, some of the challenges associated with revenue. There's also some challenges with quality on the wastewater side, and still groundwater, which is an important supply. But our board, about three, three or four years ago, created a program called Water Reliability 2020 to get us even more diverse supply, double the amount of recycled water, increase conservation, and explore looking at the ocean. Uh, many inland agencies are always surprised when they see coastal agencies not exploring this as an option. Our board said we have to look at this, but unlike some of, of the other projects, we have to be dedicated to doing it in a way that protects marine life. So a very important part of our project going forward is how we can do this in an environmentally responsible manner. I mentioned before about our recycling plant. It's actually named the Edward C. Little Water Recycling Facility. Uh, Director Little is a uh, current board member. He was also there and very instrumental in getting this plant as well as some of the satellite facilities constructed in the 1990s. Um, this is not the only facility we have. We actually have one main facility located in El Segundo near the uh, Los Angeles International Airport. We have three satellite facilities located at oil refineries. They are a major user of water, and because none of their water needs are potable needs, we can actually treat the water to fit the needs of uh, what they're looking for. Um, over the last 14 years, we've invested over a half a billion dollars in this system and it's generated over 140 billion gallons of recycled water. So something we're very proud of. I mentioned before, uh, we're the only plant in the world that produces designer water uh, to this extent. Five different types of water, all from secondary treated wastewater from our partner, the City of Los Angeles Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, the first tertiary water is conventional recycled water, which most, most people are aware of, good for watering the lawns and golf courses. The second is nitrified tertiary water. Um, this is for the oil refineries cooling towers. They're very sensitive to ammonia, so we need to be able to strip that out of the water for them. We basically do this through a biological reactor and uh, get the ammonia down to below one parts per million. The third is something uh, that's very unique and, uh, uh, to West Basin as well as to Southern California, and that's the concept of indirect potable reuse. Um, Orange County Water District does this at a very large scale. Uh, we do it just for the barrier at the West Coast Basin. Uh, we basically send it through the advanced treatment processes of microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and advanced oxidation. Uh, after this, we do stabilize the water because it's too aggressive uh, after it comes out of the RO. Um, all that water goes back into the ground and not only keeps seawater back, but also replenishes the groundwater basin. Number four and five are also reverse osmosis technologies, and these are for the oil refineries, uh, but these are not designed to ultimately be potable supplies, so they're not conditioned after. Um, the fifth, double pass reverse osmosis, actually produces a water with a total dissolved solids of less than five. So these are for the low and high pressure boiler feeds at those oil refineries. Uh, just a snapshot here of the groundwater basin that sits uh, within West Basin Service Area. And, and I'll clarify this a little later, but this is not the responsibility of West Basin. Uh, we are the imported water wholesaler working through Metropolitan. There's a separate entity who manages this basin. So we basically treat the water and then sell it to our partner at the Water Replenishment District. All of that water goes into the West Coast Basin. Uh, you see two other uh, barrier, you see two other barriers there. Um, they're operated by uh, different entities, uh, but all within the same groundwater basin. So this is the program uh, initiated by our board uh, approximately three years ago. And it's a very simple concept. Let's increase local supplies. Uh, not only is it good to have uh, a diverse portfolio, but some of these supplies 
are very energy uh, efficient com in comparison to our al al alternative sources. So in double conservation, double recycling, and then look at the uh, concept of ocean water desalination. Uh, also, always in any talk that we do, we, al we always want to promote the amount of conservation that we do. Uh, this is something very common in, uh, in Southern California. A lot of water districts do this. Uh, the success of our program really is because of partnerships with other agencies like Metropolitan as well as the Bureau of Reclamation. So a number of these programs, this is our responsibility to get out in the community, not only at the household level, but also the residential. So a big part of what we do is conservation. And I'm not going to talk about uh, all the exciting things we're doing in uh, ocean water desalination, but I do want to just remind uh, the group here that uh, our board has directed us to only do this if we can follow the four E's and that's to respect the environment, uh, make sure that we're incorporating energy efficient technologies in, uh, make sure we can do this at a cost competitive uh, price so that it's not uh, a lot more expensive than our alternatives, and then ultimately just like with any project we have to do, we have to be able to communicate that need to the public. Um, that picture on the lower right is something uh, that we're trying that's very unique. It's the concept of a wedge wire screen um, to reduce entrainment into our, uh, our intake pumps, so something we're demonstrating out in Redondo Beach. But on to the recycled water and the challenges that we face in terms of increasing our production twofold. Uh, this here is a very simplistic chart of what our goal is. It's a very uh, big goal. And that's basically to get our, by 2020, to get the recycling water production up to 70,000 acre feet. And currently we're at about 30,000 acre feet. So a lot of projects, a lot of partnerships will have to be made in order for us to get to this, uh, this goal. However, there are some issues, and that's the point of our, uh, my presentation today, is to talk about what are the challenges West Basin has in developing these supplies, and then also to quickly and generally address what we're doing to address uh, to fix those. Um, with the recycled water, um, we have a very good story to tell, um, but there are some challenges, and these are a few of ours. Water supply sources definitely have an impact on your ability to recycle. Um, where our partners who treat the water at the wastewater level get their water from affects the salinity of our water. Um, you heard a lot today from Metropolitan and the City of Los Angeles as they shift their supplies from the LA Aqueduct over to Metropolitan, as Metropolitan balances their supplies from the state project in Colorado River, our salinities vary drastically. And that could change 100, 200 parts on the salinity. That's something that can have an impact on our downstream uh, irrigation users. Conservation, definitely an issue from the revenue side. Uh, the city of LA has done an excellent job conserving water. Every, every drop of water they conserve is less, less wastewater we can get over to recycle. And the concentrations accordingly increase because you're taking out the good water. So I'm gonna show you a slide that shows the impact of partly because of conservation on the quality of water we get at West Basin. And that's influent water quality variability addresses some of those specifics. Uh, delivery and distribution is definitely a challenge. Um, when we have uh, people in our community saying we want you to do more water recycling, we agree. But it is a challenge to get the recycled water to where we need to get it. If we want to put it in the ground, it requires a lot of injection wells. And it's very hard to find space, especially in the coastal community, to do that. If we want to recharge it in spreading basins, it would take uh, tens, uh, literally tens of miles to get the water to where those basins are. Regular, regulatory requirements uh, are definitely a challenge for some. We feel that we've had a very good partnership uh, with the regional board as well as the Department of Public Health, so we don't really see that as a huge impediment. And then public perception. You could build the greatest project, uh, the cheapest project, uh, but if the public is not behind it, uh, you cannot build it. So. These are the, the issues that we face at West Basin. And uh, another uh, challenge for us, even though we have excellent uh, working relationships with all of these agencies, is these are the, the different entities with different boards that we have to work with in order to get a recycled water project moving forward. We don't create our own west, wastewater. The City of LA Bureau of Sanitation does that. Um, we don't. Uh, we pay for this water through the City of LA, another partner with us, the Department of Water and Power. The Department of Public Works at the LA County actually operates the barrier. Water Replenishment District actually manages the groundwater basin. LA Regional Water Quality Control permits us. 
um, working with the public health uh, department as well as Metropolitan Water District who really helps us subsidize the cost of this project. So as you can see, a lot of partners and while no matter how good your relationship is, if you have different entities managing this, it does affect the speed of, uh, of making a project move forward. So this is just a very simplistic uh, trend to show you the impact of conservation on uh, our influent into the Edward C. Water Recycling Facility. Turbidity is not the only sign of um, microfiltration fouling. However, it is a good representative. So this shows you the water quality challenges that we've faced um, since, the, um, since the plant was constructed in 1995. You've seen a stead steady increase in turbidity. Ammonia, as I mentioned before, our second quality of water uh, involves stripping ammonia. When we designed our facility, we designed it for an influent of 28 milligrams per liter of ammonia. Now we deal with anything from 35 to 50 milligrams per liter. So not having the right treatment capacity in, in place can definitely affect you. One of the uh, good uh, results of the partnership between Hyperion, uh, the wastewater side, and West Basin is that we helped segregate flows at the plant about 10 years ago to keep high salinity waters out of our feed. In doing that, we actually got higher ammonia as, uh, as concentrations started to increase. And you can guess which side of the plant ends up coming to West Basin. Uh, it is the east side, or that uh, very lovely neon green. So our goal is to figure out ways how can we address um, that high ammonia. The other thing that happens a lot with water recycling because of the success of a lot of projects, especially in Southern California, is the assumption is that to recycle costs the same amount no matter where you do it, whether that's San Diego, Orange County, or LA. And that's very different. It all depends on a few factors uh, that include uh, the wastewater quality, uh, what you're doing with recycled water, how you handle your sludge, what the costs are for discharges, uh, and then how many stakeholders are involved. So our average cost for water recycling is $1,600 an acre foot. Uh, it's a very important uh, number to remember because as we're developing local supplies, we have to make sure we're not doing any that cost way too much. So our board uh, two years ago initiated a three-pronged approach for really looking at how, what, what West Basin can do to help improve the quality, increase production, and reduce cost. And I'll be working backwards through this process. Um, basically, at the Edward C. Little Water Recycling Facility, our goal is to move more water through the microfiltration membranes. What can we do to increase that? Uh, can we also look at a pretreatment process that will help stabilize the, the quality as it comes over from our partner, Hyperion? And then, Hyperion, what can we do over there to help improve the quality? Um, so we came up with a list of solutions. Uh, this was staff's list, um, and this was in 2010. We showed this list of options. Our board said within the budget that we have, make it all happen. So we looked at everything here. Um, we looked at different ways to clean the, the microfiltration membranes. We looked at a various suite of pretreatment options, some uh, very technically feasible, some uh, very long-term research ideas. And then we came up with a lot of uh, good ideas for Hyperion. However, it's hard to come up with ideas for a separate agency. So we worked very closely with them to see what could we actually develop. Um, we were able to get rid of a few. We tested them. They don't work that great. And then we went through each one of these over the last two and a half years and then was able to develop a cost benefit of what really is going to get us the most bang for our buck. In terms of membrane cleaning, just to show you what we tried, uh, this is an un unprecedented approach to looking at membrane cleaning. Um, we tried everything here. And while a lot of these work excellent, um, we have to look at the cost for that. Uh, doing an enzymatic cleaner on your microfiltration uh, 50 times in a year is, not, is quite cost prohibitive. So we did an analysis here to see what, what really helps us. So a lot of this was done operationally. It was done while we were running the plant. Uh, and we got a lot of good data out of this. I also want to uh, interject as I walk through what we did here just to talk about advanced treatment and how it's evolved. And that's going to really lead us into what, we, what we're doing with ozone. Um, back in the 1970s, uh, to advance treat wastewater, Orange County Water District was the first to employ reverse osmosis membranes, uh, something that we at West Basin looked to, to learn from. Our first phase was built like this, a very conventional pretreatment 
ultimately feeding into reverse osmosis, all that going back in the ground. What West Basin helped pioneer uh, was the first installation, uh, full-scale installation of microfiltration pre-treating reverse osmosis. We did that in the mid-90s uh, with the MEMCOR system. In the next decade, uh, a few agencies started to detect low molecular weight organics slipping through the reverse osmosis, and the concept of advanced oxidation was included. And because of our varying water quality, uh, West Basin's approach through our evaluation is to look at including ozone as a pretreatment to help reduce the amount of fouling on the microfiltration and get more water through the system. Uh, I heard there were a lot of PhDs in the audience today, so I asked what our most colorful technical slide is, and I got this fluorescent, fluorescence excitation emission graph just to show you the difference of influent ozone um, or what's coming into the ozone what comes out after, all the things that it's removing are what causes problems with microfiltration fouling. So just an example of what we're looking at in order to uh, increase production. This also, this is some very preliminary work, but this preliminary work actually helped our board commit to a $60 million ozone phase five construction, which was basically if our membranes clog very quick, the, the transmembrane pressure increases rapidly, and then we have to shut down and clean. How long can we prolong that and keep the membranes running? And then we can see that ozone versus no ozone, there's a, a tremendous impact. There are a lot of other issues, though, to look at with this. We're not saying this is going to be a very simple uh, issue to address. Uh, there are concerns about byproducts, and, and nitrosodimethylamine is a uh, common concern, um, as well as impacts on the RO. So far, we have seen minimal impacts on the RO with the minor pressure reduction. We have seen elevated NDMA, so we're going to have to relook at our uh, back end of our UV treatment. And finally, uh, with the time I have, I just want to talk about the work we're doing with Hyperion. Uh, like I said, we've got a very good partnership with Hyperion. Their job is to treat 450 MGD peak of wastewater for the city of Los Angeles. They're the end of the line, pl end of the line plant. So they have a very big responsibility. Their number one goal was never to recycle that water. We had approached them in the 1990s to do that. However, they've been very open to uh, looking at uh, their treatment process. This is a, uh, a plan view of Hyperion located just south of LAX. Everything on the right is the liquid side of the treatment. On the left is the solids. In the very right, Lower right corner is our pump station, so you can imagine those, there's two of nine secondary modules that we basically take water off of. So uh, Hyperion, uh, on their own, uh, uh, commissioned a study with uh, Corolo engineers to look at what are some short-term and long-term approaches to improve ammonia as well as removal of other foulants in the water that would hurt West Basin. So there was this study done of many different alternatives. Uh, it included uh, the side stream treatment. Is it feasible to apply an Anamox or Sharon process or even a, a membrane bioreactor to the side streams and help reduce ammonia? A lot of these did work. However, the cost was very high. Uh, in the end, what they found was there was a couple options. Uh, Hyperion is a high purity oxygen plant. They're designed to treat a lot of water in a small area. If we converted a couple of these modules uh, to the MLE process, um, which is more a conventional air-activated sludge with nitrification, denitrification, we could get a substantial less uh, or a lot less ammonia and a lot higher quality coming over. However, these kind of changes take a lot of capital infrastructure that's not on our facility, so it's not very easy for us to just say, go ahead and do it. They also looked at centrate rerouting, some of those high ammonia streams that come back to the plant. Maybe they can distribute them so that they, we can lower our ammonia. So it's a very positive study. One of the other things we're testing is uh, in just increasing the SRT on the high purity oxygen system. Even something as, uh, like this requires infrastructure changes. So we wanna make sure that we test all of those. Um, this is a, it may look like a convoluted graph, uh, but it's a very valuable one to us that Corolo developed, which is basically looking at what's the ammonia concentration coming out what are the costs of different options? Each data point represents a different options. And then what is the EPS or the extra polymeric substances coming out? The lower, the better. So we could find the sweet spot on options, uh, low cost options that have a high impact on ammonia removal and EPS removal, and we can focus on those. 
So we have a few options. Once again, the, we have to work with our partners at the city of LA to see if they're willing to partner in something like this. But this is how we're developing some of the solutions for those problems. With that, uh, I conclude and uh, thanks for the time.